Hi everyone, and welcome to Quarren Streaming. My name is Albert Lawrence, Television Academy Foundation alumnus and your host for tonight, coming to you pre-taped from a heavily disinfected studio in downtown Los Angeles. Now, in a fun twist, the Television Academy is hosting this virtual event, not in spite of the quarantine, but because of it. Since early March, several shows have seen massive resurgences in viewership on streaming services. And it seems that in the absence of our friends and family, we turn to our TV friends and family. Does Tony Soprano's existential angst help us release tension? Does the Bartlett White House transport us to another world? Do we find peace in knowing Dr. Meredith Grey will always be there? Well, we're here to find out. And before we get started, I want to thank the Television Academy Activities Committee, chaired by Governors Steve Spignese and Michael Ruscio, as well as the Television Academy staff for their contributions to tonight's event. Joining us to introduce our first show, The West Wing, please welcome our moderator, television critic at Entertainment Weekly, the wonderful Kristen Baldwin. Take it away, Kristen. Hi everyone, I'm Kristen Baldwin from Entertainment Weekly, and I'm here with Tommy Schlamy, Emmy-winning exec producer and director of The West Wing, Emmy nominee Dulé Hill, who starred as Charlie Young, and Emmy winner Richard Schiff, who starred as White House Communications Director Toby Ziegler. So it has been 14 years since the West Wing series finale, and yet the show is still remarkably popular. What do you think it is that makes the West Wing so rewatchable? I think the West Wing has always had a rewatchability to it, even when we aren't in as uh, anxious times as we are right now. You have two of the people or the reasons that really people are rewatching this show. Uh, and I think the music of Aaron's writing, someone once told me that when we listen to an hour of music, every hour of music we listen to, 55 minutes of that is music we've already heard before. Uh, and so I think in some ways this show, and I think Dulé, you've expressed this before, there's a rhythm to the show. There's a musical rhythm. Even when I shot the pilot, I sort of did it orchestrally. I tried to sort of lay it out as music. So I think there's also music to this show that causes people to go back to it. Those are the bigger strokes. I think it's a good show. I think it was well done. <laughs> and I think uh, it's uh, very affirming, uh, life affirming. And I think, uh, and it's a celebration of the human spirit. And I think that also is a reason that people go back to it. Dulé or Richard, anything you'd like to add? I mean, I will add that I, I think there's an idealism in this show. There's a, there's, a, there's a part of the show that challenged us to be the best version of ourselves. We walked, you know, all the characters on the show, they walked around with conflict. They really thought about things. They didn't just fly off at the cuff and make decisions. And I think of where we are today in society where there's a void of that. I think there's a void of that in leadership. I think there's a void of that every day in society and how people are dealing with each other. So I think that when people go back and watch the show, that there's something that's inspiring or re-inspiring about that, that it reminds people of this is who we could be. We could actually aspire to be these, like this version of ourselves and not the version that we see every day on, on television or in, the, or in the news. One of the uh, phenomenal um, aspects of the West Wing is that uh, it depicted people in office and pu public service who, to a man and to a woman, wanted to leave the world a better place than how they found it. That is a, a, a quality that even if the work is tough and, and frustrating and uh, uh, <clears throat> not accomplishable, it feels better. And here you have um, a fictional uh, White House of, re of flawed but really good people who wanted to do the best that they could possibly do. We miss that in, um, in in all facets of life right now, because we're just, you know, uh, it's a it's a mob frenzy out there right now, and in, in all aspects of of um, <clears throat> of our of our lives, and it's um, it's frightening. So, you know, why not go back to something that makes us feel better? Right, and you know, one of the things about all these characters, in addition to being very smart and hyper articulate, they were also very relatable to viewers, which I think, you know, was a big part of the appeal of this show. Um, and I don't know, Tommy, what do you think in terms of cr the creation of the show and developing it that first season? You know, what was it about those characters that people were so drawn to? Every show is a family show. Somewhere in it, you've created a family. And this was a family. This was, uh, I always felt there was a mother and a father. It was Martin and John. 
And then there are, you know, uh, all the family members that came around that. And these people, as Richard was just sort of saying, besides committing themselves and wanting to do better for the world, they also loved each other. You could feel that. And I think a great deal of that was Aaron's enormous balance of drama and comedy and the sort of never taking themselves too seriously, but being completely committed to the job they had to do. People were watching The West Wing over and over again two years ago, four years ago. During Obama, they were watching it over and over again. So there is just something universally appealing to the show that makes it even richer at a moment like now, uh, today when we see such a, uh, a void in what this show was about. But it's right. always been there. Uh, and I think part of what's always been there is the relationship between all of these people on the show. So Dulé Charlie first appears in episode three and you have that incredible interview scene with Josh played by Bradley Whitford. And then there's that tense mo moment later in the Oval Office with Mariah, or sorry, with Martin Sheen's Jed Bartlett. And, you know, it's such a great first episode. What do you remember about shooting that day or those days? <laughs> I remember meeting Martin and being really nervous. And he came up to me and he taught me this handshake that Lawrence Fishburne taught him during Apocalypse Now. And it took, oh away, it took away a lot of the, I guess the pressure that I was feeling because I, I, I saw that he was relatable. I saw that he was a person, that he wasn't this icon of an actor. I mean, he, he is an icon of an actor, but beyond that, he was a, a person that was, that was accessible. And then I, I remember, I mean, just doing the scene, like doing the scene with Brad and wanted to make sure I knew my lines, wanted to make sure that I knew my lines exactly as they were written, <laughs> because that's the one thing that I knew coming in is you need to know your lines exactly as they were written and just being thankful to be there. And uh, Richard, by, your, by his own admission, Toby is not one of the most pleasant people around, but you turned him into a really beloved character. In the early days of the show, how did you find that balance to really sort of uh, convey the warmth that was underneath Toby's uh, sort of demanding persona? You know, Tommy pointed out how Aaron writes music and, uh, and Dulé um, as well said, you know, there's a there's an orchestration to to the language and and there and there are instruments that need to be played you know and uh, I uh, I remember early on it just felt like there was uh, you know violins and and flutes and um, and uh, that kind of thing and it felt like like um, uh, that Toby could be a deeper uh, instrument or a darker instrument or a, or a more bass instrument and um, I think I said this once before in in Texas, that uh, I decided to to make uh, to uh, Toby uh, the oboe. No one knows it it's playing until everyone else stops, and then you hear this kind of beautiful tone. He was dark and, and ornery, um, but he he was an oboe, <laughs> so 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 he was listenable to. You could hear him. I don't know. I don't know how to. Say, I don't know what I did twenty years ago, but um, I'm glad I'm glad you found something to like about him. Oh, very much. I mean, Tommy, what would you add to both of these characters in terms of their introduction and their appeal? Well, look, I think I think one thing that Richard's leaving out is that he brings to it all this warmth. He really does, and this sort of humanity. But I would say that Aaron and myself never thought of uh, Toby as a dark, I mean, a dark, dark character in any way. Uh, it was actually a, a character who was filled with love and compassion and an enormous desire to do the right thing. Uh, that's a pretty virtuous character. That's not a character who's just trying to fuck things up for everybody. Uh, it, it is, and, and I think we had always thought of him in those terms. As far as Dulé, it was like, to me, when Dulé came on the show, we had the show, then we you know, um, uh, brought Dulé in on the third episode. And honestly, it was like, oh, okay, there's a whole new garden. There was like a, a whole other, uh, you know, it's specifically about youth and about this idea of idealism and this kid who was a bicycle messenger who's now moving up to this place. It just gave it a whole other level of humanity that said pretty much anyone could join this family. And then he allowed, you know, those moments of between takes that we would all, you know, just push Dulé in a corner and just go, could you please tap dance again and, and make all of us feel a little bit better uh, to watch this. <laughs> Except Catherine Houston. 
expression, both with his feet and his face. And, you know, it was just a really a gift for us that uh, we were able to find this guy who fortunately needed a job. Uh, and we were the, the lucky benefactors of that. Wait, do like Catherine Houston didn't want to watch you tap dance? Oh yeah, I could dance anywhere on the set besides Mrs. Lanningham's office. <laughs> she would be, she would be at the desk, and I would start dancing, and she would look up, and she'd go, "Dule." <laughs> so I always knew I can go in the Oval Office, I can go out in the hallway, but not there in uh, Charlie and uh, Mrs. Lanningham's office. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, she she loved me dancing, but I danced all the time. So she was like, "You know what? You can dance anywhere else besides here." <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> So, of course, obviously the walk and talk shots, the tracking shots were a huge part of this show and a real signature part of its style. So first, Tommy, can you tell us about developing this shooting style and why do you think it was so integral into the West Wing's success? I had been lucky enough to have spent two nights uh, uh, in the West Wing, in the um, uh, residence uh, during the Clinton administration. And I remember we were invited down to the Oval Office this was well before West Wing. It was years before that. And I remember being out in front of what was Miss Landingham's office. Um, and, you know, people were coming out and going in through the doors. For all I know, they were ordering lunch. But it just <laughs> felt to me they're talking about the most important things in the world. And they've just got to keep talking. So they'd come out of the meeting all talking. And I'd watch them go out the door still talking. And it was Cisneros and Stephanopoulos. And it was just, you know, and it was so exciting. And I remembered that. And I thought, God, can we bring that excitement, that level of energy uh, to this, this world that then we had to build? Of course, one of the most famous walk and talks for the whole series is in Five, Five Votes Down, which was at the Ambassador Hotel. And Charlie and Toby have a big role sort of at the end there. When Richard and Dulé, what do you remember about that shoot? I read that it took 29 takes. No, that, that was my memory. Tommy, you corrected me on that, right? It was 11, you it said? Was 11 takes. It was 11 takes. I, Dave I, I might have, have done 29 I, takes. Yeah, my, uh, my memory of it may have uh, projected uh, 29 takes because that's what it felt <laughs> like. Um, <laughs> Um, uh, what do I remember about it? I, well, I, I just told the story recently where uh, the, the sound guy almost lost his life going backwards down the steps at one point. Our, our wired mics uh, were not working. And so he goes, I can, uh, I've done documentaries. I can handle this with a boom. He's holding up a boom. And, uh, you know, we go through two flights of stairs and he started on the first flight going backwards, trying to boom all of us as we're interweaving in this choreography to, uh, uh, to be next to the president so we can have our conversations. And uh, he went flying <laughs> down the steps uh, and people caught him. And then we had to wait for two hours until the, uh, wired, um, the wires were fixed. Um, but I just remember it being a very difficult but fun uh, challenge. Um, and, you know, as in all challenging walk and talks, the thing that comes to mind towards the end of them, if they're successful, is don't mess up the last line or two, because not only will everyone be really mad at you, but I'll, you'll be really mad at yourself. That is the absolute worst, being in a walk and talk and having to say something at the end. I mean, that's, I, I would agree with Richard. That is like my worst fear as an actor. <laughs> It's like, please let me say my lines first. At least if I mess up, we can start all over. But to have everyone knock it out the park and then to get to the end, and even for me to come in and say, here you go, Mr. President, and then you stumble it, it is the worst feeling. <laughs> you want to run, run your head into a wall. Richard, we, we have to talk, of course, about your Emmy-winning episode in Excelsis Deo. Um, what was your first reaction to reading that script in which Toby, you know, uh, arranges for a military funeral for a, for a homeless veteran, sort of through an act of chance, really. It was uh, Toby being dragged into that rather than him being, that him being uh, 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 pulled into it. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, he was pushed rather than pulled. He was, he was uh, I don't know. It, it was just, uh, I got very upset at the script and then talked to Tommy about it and talked to Aaron about it and, and was in tears over it. And um, and they were both incredible and said, no, 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 this was just a first draft and we're going to fix this. And I think it's I think it had to do with the fact that it was written for another character. 
originally. So it hadn't been really adjusted completely for Toby. Um, and I think that's part of the reason. But what that turned into, and why I'm so proud of that episode, is that um, you know, my issues as an actor was it was completely addressed. It was it was it was listened to and um and agreed with. And um the end result was better, I think, than it would have been in the first place had that not happened. And in the end, I think it was one of the most beautiful uh, uh, episodes of television that I, you know, that I've ever been a part of. And so I'm very grateful for that collaboration. And it, it, by the way, it just shows you just can't change the name of the character and put a different character in there. These people were unique and specific. You know, <clears throat> The West Wing was not a show that, you know, eight days before you start shooting, you have this script and everybody's uh, kind of moving along. And uh, it was, you know, there was a much more organic feel to it. You know, Aaron was writing every script. Uh, and this was still early on, you know, and Richard has a, a very, um, very finely tuned, you know, it doesn't surprise me that Richard directs also and that he, you know, it's a finely tuned ear for not just my character, but for the bigger story. And so for us, it was just a, a fulfilling to know that this character uh, was uh, being able to offer us so much uh, in the script form. And then I also remember Alex Graves, who directed that, just so brilliantly directed that and, and realized for me as a director, the West Wing just had all this other potential for other people to come in and to put their own stamp on it and to be able to sort of go, that's clearly an Alex Graves episode. And that was actually fulfilling as opposed to there's a mold that you have to follow that everybody had a way to come in and bring their best to it. Well, uh, Tommy Shlami, Richard Schiff, Dulé Hill, thank you so much for joining us for this great discussion and uh, stay safe and be well. Thank you for having thank us. You. A huge thank you to Thomas Shlami, Richard Schiff, and Dulé Hill for joining us. And now let's explore the darker side of comfort. Let's join Kristen and just a few of the geniuses that keep the Sopranos in our queues year after year. Hi everyone, I'm here with three fine gentlemen from The Sopranos, David Chase, the Emmy-winning creator and executive producer, Stephen Van Zandt, the SAG award-winning actor who starred as Silvio Dante, and Steve Buscemi, the Emmy-winning actor and director who starred in season five as Tony Blundetto. Thanks so much for being here, you guys. Thank you. Good to be here. Thank you. So, uh, Steve, as someone who worked on this show, both in front of and behind the camera, why do you think, what do you think it is about The Sopranos that makes it so rewatchable? A combination of things, but first of all, it's just, it's great writing. Um, the cast is phenomenal, and it, yeah, I mean, it, it does go to dark places for sure, but uh, what I always loved about it is that it also had a lot of humor, and and that it wasn't just about the mob. It was as much about Tony's family as it was about his associates and, uh, and his business. It's kind of amazing that uh, we watched this, this guy do, you know, do these things um, that is appropriate in his world, but is, you know, horrifying to the viewer sometimes. And yet, you know, you see him dealing with stress you see him, you know, trying to overcome that by by going to th therapy. So yeah, to me, it's just it's a combination of uh, all those things. And uh, David, The Sopranos started as a feature film idea that you had, and then you developed it as a series, which landed at HBO. For you, what were the challenges of adapting this movie idea about a mobster in therapy with a difficult mother? into a TV series? Well, it happened gradually. I mean, all I had to do at first was write a pilot, which was kind of what the movie would have been. And then from there, it was just kind of on the job training. Stevie, you had never acted before The Sopranos. What? Tell me about your reaction when David contacted you after seeing you in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction. Uh, and talk to you about auditioning for the role of Tony Soprano, I believe. It was um, hard to fully grasp it, obviously, because uh, when he first asked me, would you like to be in the show? I, I, I said, you know, 
that's very nice, but no, thank you. You know, I'm not, I'm not an actor, you know? And uh, he said very clearly, yes, yes, you are an actor. You, you just don't know it yet, you know? And the truth is, I didn't really, you know, at that point I was at a very big crossroads in my life. And um, David uh, was just so wonderful. He offered me a whole new career, went down there and, um, we, you know, we talked about uh, Tony Soprano for for a minute, um, but um, cooler heads prevailed in the end, and uh, the right guy became Tony Soprano. And and um, in the end, uh, it, it really worked out well because I ended up, you know, I think David and and the other writers, you know, realized that it was a something that could be used for my real life. And uh, me becoming the underboss and the consigliere, you know, I used what, what my relationship with Bruce Springsteen for many years and. Uh, and, and so it felt very, very natural to me. I, I knew what that dynamic was, being, being the right-hand guy and, and uh, being the only one that's going to bring the boss the bad news, you know, occasionally and things like that, you know, that I, I had lived through. So it actually became, um, you know, a much easier way for me to, for me to begin acting. I, I was doing something that I was quite familiar with. David, you had said in the past you'd wanted Steve Buscemi on the show from the beginning, but you were too, quote, embarrassed to ask him because he had such a thriving film career. And he had said that he was hoping to be on the show as an actor, but he was too shy to ask. Who made the first yeah. move when it came <laughs> to getting him to play Tony Blundetto? I did, I think. I mean, he had been directing episodes. And then I felt more comfortable asking him. And he said, yes. And I wasn't embarrassed uh, to ask him. I just thought, you know, uh, self-abnegation. Um, he's a movie star and I'm in television. I was still still feeling that kind of emotion, having been in network all the time. And Steve, not only did you get to be on The Sopranos, you got to have one of the best death scenes in the entire series. Uh, did David warn you about how Tony B would die or how did uh, how did you find out? Well, you know, this was the thing on the show, and David knows this. Um, the actors would always joke about you never wanted to get a call from David, you know, because <laughs> that usually meant that you were going to die. But I was contracted for two seasons, and so um, I did get a call from David. <laughs> but I thought, mm. you know what? It doesn't that doesn't necessarily mean that. Tony B is going to die. You know, maybe he's calling me for a different reason. I shouldn't be <laughs> too negative. <laughs> but then uh, David took me to lunch and we sat down. And the first thing he said was, look, I, I, you know, we don't know how to keep you alive. And then we had a really nice lunch, you know, but, but um, um, it was a surprise. But I think it's that way for everybody on the show, you know, who got whacked is that um, I don't know how far David, you know, you, you know in advance, you know, like how long a character is going to live, but the actors don't. Do you know David in advance or is it something that sort of is organic with the story as it develops? Well, I knew Edie Falco wasn't going to get popped. Um, <laughs> that's about it. Um, or the kids. Um, yeah, I, I probably, yes, I do know because we, plot out the whole thing before we start writing. So yeah, I know who it's going, usually. But the and thing with Steve was, that was a problem. I, we, I didn't foresee the fact that we story-wise had put his character in a position where he couldn't survive and fill out his two-year contract. And uh, David, you've said that uh, before that James Gandolfini had a lot to do with Tony's personality and how it developed as the show progressed. How would you say his performance influenced the way you wrote the character as the show went on? I had this image in my head of of the gangster, you know, and uh, there was a scene in the pilot where Chris, his nephew, threatens to go to Hollywood. And it's said in the script that Tony gives him like a, a love tap, sort of. And uh, when it came to shoot it, <laughs> Chris was drinking this soda or beer, and uh, when it came to shoot it, Jim picked him up out of the chair. I didn't go off his feet. 
and uh, <laughs> was shaking him and screaming at him. I thought, oh yeah, that's the way it should be. And also you could hear his beer bottle rolling along the um, pavement. That was, that was my favorite part. <laughs> <laughs> So he helped uh, tell you which direction the character should maybe go. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And Stevie, I mean, obviously Gandolfini had such a, an incredible presence on screen. How would you describe what it was like to act in a scene with him, whether it was just guys, you know, shooting the shit at the bada bing or, you know, something more intense? Well, as I've said many times, uh, you, you shoot a scene with Jimmy and you, and you walked away a better actor. And he just had this an attitude on the set that, um, that you know, he gave me respect right away. Mm -hmm. And all the other actors did too, you know? Yeah. Uh, which was a nice, a nice, a nice surprise. I wasn't sure how they were going to react to an outsider, so to speak, coming into their world, you know? Right, right. I just say I recall the last episode when Silvio was in bed dying. You know, Every time an actor is finished, they give you give them a bottle of champagne and a little cake, um, and they say that's you know that, that's a wrap for uh, in this case Stephen Van Zandt. And Jim said, looked over at me and he said, "Well, that's it for you and me working with a rock and roll star." <laughs> <laughs> that's great. You know, one of the things that is great about The Sopranos is that um, the stories leave a lot of questions unanswered, which is much like life. Um, Steve, how often are you asked what happened to the Russian in Pine Barrens? Um, for a while I was, but I think people knew they weren't. <laughs> they just weren't going to find find out. Uh, probably David was asked more than me. But because I would just say, well, I don't know. I mean, I don't I don't write the show. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, Stevie, do you think that Sill ever came out of the coma or no? Uh, you know, we 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 kind of played around with it a little bit. Lilyhammer, uh, you know, um, you know, in some people's minds, you know, he came out of the coma and, <laughs> and went into witness protection <laughs> in Lilyhammer doorway. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, but it was actually the guy Frankie the Fixer I played in Lily Hammer was actually quite a quite a different character. But al although he looked he looked similar. And, uh, you know, of course, the Sopranos finale is so iconic in part because the ending is ambiguous. Um, so, Steve and Stevie, I guess I want to ask you, what's your interpretation? What do you think happened to Tony? I thought the ending was brilliant. You know, like I was. It was so shocking. And of course, I think like a lot of people, I thought something was wrong with my t television set. And in <laughs> fact, I know a friend of mine who was out for the evening and he asked his son to DVR the show. And when he came home and, and he watched it and it went to black, he started yelling at his son for not getting it all. <laughs> um, but, uh, I, I was so like sort of shocked, but then also relieved. That whole last season for me was, uh, for me, it was, you know, very dark and, um, and I was sort of dreading, you know, like, oh my God, this is going to be awful. If Tony, you know, like if Tony gets killed or if, if a family member gets killed or if they get, you know, or if they have to get all of them to, just to get to him, I was just so anxious and nervous that when it was over and not knowing what happened to him was a relief to me. And I couldn't sleep that night because I was so um, I was just so blown away at uh, the brilliance of the ending, um, and I just uh, I just thought it was so so incredibly brave and ballsy. Um, yeah. I loved it. And Stevie, what about you? We um we were at a um I guess Steve, you may not have been there, but a lot of the cast was uh, watched the thing at the Hard Rock. Uh, hotel down in Florida, uh, which was an amazing event, uh, first of all. Um, literally, like, thousands of people showed up. So I, And I said to Jimmy, uh, you know, you ever wonder what it's like to be a rock star? Well, this, this is it. <laughs> um, and we, um, so we all watched it together, and, and I just so happened to be on a, 
on a uh, nationwide uh, radio show the next morning. So I got hit by everybody nationwide, you know, <laughs> all complaining, you know. And so finally I said, okay, well, let, let's hear your brilliant ending, you know. Let, let's hear, let, you know, if this was such a bad ending, let's hear yours, you know. Do you want Tony to die? Well, no. Do you want Edie to die? Well, no. Do you want the kids to die? Well, no. Okay, so, you know, and after an hour of that, you know, they started to come around, you know, and realize, oh, maybe this is a, maybe this is not only a, not a bad ending, it's actually a great ending. And uh, we did a, we did a, I think it was Vanity Fair years after the show ended, uh, they did a Vanity Fair uh, article talking, talking to the actors and directors and, and, uh, and I think I ended the article, they asked me the question, okay, you know, what really happened? I said, okay, now I'm going to give you a scoop here and tell you the actual, what actually really <laughs> happened. All right, you know, let's not, no more, no more fooling around, you know? And they said, uh, I said, okay, now here's, this is it, you ready? And they said, okay, okay, what happened? What happened? I said, the director yelled cut and the actors went home. <laughs> And that, and that was the end of that. Well, it's been such a joy to talk to all of you. I thank you so much for being here, and I hope you all stay safe and sane during <laughs> our ongoing quarantine. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to David Chase, Stephen Van Zant, and Steve Buscemi, not only for being here, but for the wonderful show you've given us. Up next, some of our favorites from Grey's Anatomy. Hi everyone, I'm here with Emmy-nominated Grey's Anatomy executive producer Krista Vernoff, Emmy-nominated actor-director Chandra Wilson, who stars as Dr. Miranda Bailey, and actor-director Kevin McKidd, who stars as Dr. Owen Hunt. Thank you guys all for being here. Fantastic. For having us. <laughs> Pleasure. So we are talking today about Corin streaming, shows that people love to return to and watch again and again and again. And what's great about Grey's Anatomy, what's unique about it, is that not only do people love to go back and watch old episodes, they're still enjoying the show today because it's still on. Um, I'd love to hear from you guys. What do you think makes this show so rewatchable? You know, I... Uh... I think one of the things, one of the simple answers is is to give some credit to the design early on, uh, sort of Peter Horton's directorial design, for it to look timeless. So you don't see a lot of fashion. Everybody's in scrubs. So you can turn it on today and uh, watch that pilot, watch those early episodes as if they're being, they, they hold up visually. There's no big trends that you go, oh, that's really out of date. There's nothing that looks particularly out of date. So I want to give that credit. And then I think they're just watchable and rewatchable because of powerful storytelling and powerful acting. It's, it's human, uh, it's emotional, it's funny, and it's one of the first shows that was really allowed consistently to be all of those things um, uh, together. Um, hair dates us a, a little bit sometimes, depending on, <laughs> I noticed that. Um, we, you know, we like predate Quarren streaming with the way people have watched our show. So, you know, it, so basically people are coming to us for like the third and fourth time <laughs> right now, which is really amazing. Or people that have said, oh, I want to do this. Everybody talks about, you know, going back and binging on Grey's and, you know, now we can do it. So it's such a, just a compliment to us. A, a, I'm, I'm forever uh, complimented by that kind of, I don't know if it's loyalty or if it's commitment or, or people just really wanting to jump into our world and not think about your own for a minute and just, you know, go live in that. And that that's one of the things that we have provided from the beginning. I'm still feel like the newcomer on the show. And, um, but I think it's the cast too. I mean, I, <laughs> I know, um, but I think it's the cast. Like when I remember when I got offered this part and I watched the first two seasons on DVD back when people watched DVDs, um, I was just blown away by the writing and the cast. And that's a testament, you know, and to get for me to be able to jump on to that ship, that to that train has just been amazing. And I think it's just that the combination of amazing writing and brilliant actors. You know? And uh, Chandra, I read that you sometimes like to go back to the pilot and rewatch it whenever you're sort of figuring out how Bailey would react in a situation. How does it help you to go back and look at that 
that first episode with her. Bailey in the pilot is who Bailey always thought that she was. Like, that's her vision of herself, that person that they call the Nazi. And everything that Bailey has now in season 16, you know, being chief, like really being responsible for the hospital, that's who she thought she was (laughs) in the pilot. So, um, So if ever I you know, as as an actor think, am I being too emotional here? Am I going down the wrong path here? You know, what what would Bailey really say? I go back to that woman in the pilot because uh, that, that really is who she thinks she is. Kevin and Krista, do you guys ever go back and watch early episodes for inspiration or, or to connect with where your characters are? Sometimes I, I go back... Um, just for inspiration, just like what 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 were we doing that allowed us to tell, you know, that abortion story alongside something that was making us laugh out loud? How were we navigating those waters? I'll go back and watch. Kevin, did you ever go back and watch your first episode, which is such a great episode? My daughter, who's 18, started binge watching Grey's Anatomy during COVID. And I walk in and she's literally the the premiere of season five, which is when, and she was just like, she was just freaked out watching me. So I sat with her in her bedroom and watched my entry to the show, which was a very surreal <laughs> moment. And I, I think Shonda and Krista came up with the idea of this character who um, was, was uh, you see him initially, and then he disappears for three episodes and he comes back traumatized from this event in the war. And it was so current at that time. I mean, it was 11 years ago that, you know, and I think that, I think that, and also the chemistry between uh, Sandra Oh and I, we were still close, close, close friends. And I think that chemistry too, with the brilliant concept of that character, this damaged war hero was, uh, I think really worked. All of our characters are so individual. Nobody, you know, like each other. And you came in and complimented all of that. I'm going to say, Chandra, your character consistently is and has been my favorite character on the show. Oh. I'll I'll send the check. The check is coming. um, (laughs) I mean, Krista, one of the things Grace has always done so well is incorporate new characters as other characters maybe cycle out. What do you think is the secret to that or what are the challenges to getting that balance right? We look at people as human beings and as doctors. So, so I think, I, I, I think that it's, it's about coming to the storytelling through the characters rather than coming at characters through story. So Chandra, as someone who's been there from the very beginning, what is the hazing ritual for new actors when they join the set? Is there, is there good natured hazing? Is there pranking? Or is it just a, a, a warm welcome hug? You know what we do? We wait for the first surgery scene and, and give them the Linda <laughs> Klein, our medical technician. And if you can make it through surgery and look like a surgeon, then you're good. You're golden. You're there to stay. <laughs> but you know what? You know, you know, you Kevin. There are people I will not name who never got there, who never could deliver dialogue while doing surgery and have had long runs on the show. <laughs> That's true. Kevin, when, when Owen came in, and we touched on this a minute uh, ago, he was like this tough guy who came in and then we sort of delved into his PTSD and like that there was really this struggle happening within him. Why do you think that was such an important story to tell? PTSD is a thing that you live with uh, for life. And, um, you know, uh, at that time it was, it was, we had many, many um, young men and women coming back from these wars and, you know, and, and, and so I did a lot of research and met a lot of veterans and I took it really, really seriously, um, and, I, and I still do. And I just think it's really important to reflect what's going on in our society right now in our show. And I think that's what we do so, so well. And I'm so proud of to be part of this show because it really puts up a mirror sometimes to what's happening in America and in the world. Well, and the show has always really, you know, even last season, the episode with the rape survivor was incredible. And like, Mm -hmm. it's 
you know, Krista for, for the show itself, like you said, it's a, it's a real blend of like stuff that's funny and makes us laugh and romance, but then these issues, what, uh, that was always in the DNA from the show of the show at the beginning, or do you feel like that's something that's grown even more over time? I think that over time, the press has started to cover the, the fact that we are progressive in our storytelling, that we look at issues. They've started to sort of cover it as if this is new. It's not new. We, do you remember when Bailey had to operate on the guy with the swastika? Yeah. That was yeah, season two, maybe? maybe? Season one or two? It was yeah. early. We were taking these things on early, but it was always... Um, there was always humor and heart surrounding it. And I mean, it seems like the format of being in a hospital allows both as a, you know, from a writer's standpoint, it makes sense for characters to come in and out. But also from a storytelling standpoint, people, the patients are from all walks of life. So you can address those issues without it feeling sort of Forced. Like it feels organic. The way that Shonda cast this show changed network television permanently. The inclusiveness uh, of the casting, the the way Shonda fought to cast the show the way the world looks, Shonda broke that mold, and and just that allows us freedom for differing perspectives. I remember when I first looked at the pilot, um, it was. After we came back to shoot the season, I hadn't even really seen the pilot when we got picked up. So um, I, I think it was Peter that said, oh, you should watch the pilot <laughs> while we were shooting. <laughs> and I remember the first thing I thought was, wow, there's something so familiar about this world. I will know this hospital when I have to step into the hospital and give birth to my son. This is what you know a hospital is going to look like and that music that always drove our show from the beginning it 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 is another character um you know in in our show the music is very specific to you know what is happening and and what uh, uh the writers and the producers producers want us to feel as audience members watching it and uh you know we've we have seen in in uh, the hospital, there's been a virus that broke out. I believe it was in season 10. Uh, but do you think uh, in season 17 that the show will address the pandemic, which at this rate will probably still be going on? Yes. Uh, unfortunately, in this country, it will. Um, uh, yes, we're going to address this pandemic for sure. There's no way to be a medical show, a long running medical show and not do wow. the medical story of our lifetimes. We've had a lot of doctors visiting our writer's room. Uh, we always do every year. We have doctors come and, and tell us their stories. And usually that's a joyful kind of laughing where they're telling their worst or their funniest or their craziest stories. And this year it has felt more like therapy. The doctors come in, wow. We're the first people they're talking to about these experiences they're having. They are literally shaking and trying not to cry. They're pale. Um, and they're talking about it as war, a war that they were not trained for. And, um, and that's been one of our big conversations about Owen, is that he's actually trained for this in a way that most of the other doctors aren't. Um, it's really painful to listen to these doctors. It's really painful to realize what they're going through on a daily basis while we're sitting at home trying not to get sick. They're in the thick of, they're having to be family and friend to their patients because families and friends aren't allowed in. They're, they're holding people while they die. They're, they're having to decide who lives and who dies. They're having people die who would not have ever died from whatever their medical condition is because there's a COVID as a factor it's, it's, it's a lot. And I feel like our show has an opportunity and a responsibility to tell some of those stories. This season was cut a little short, um, but we still had a very exciting finale uh, with a lot uh, that happened. And one of the things that people love so much about the show, uh, too, are the couples um, and the romances and the hookups. Now, uh, Chandra, Miranda and Ben's marriage is definitely couple goals. Why do you think it is that Dr. Bailey is basically the only one who's able to have a functional relationship <laughs> in this hospital? 
because <laughs> Ben puts up with her, I think is the reason he understands her and she appreciates the fact that he does. And most certainly we're not a perfect couple, but I appreciate the opportunity to be able to show everything isn't roses all the time. And when it is roses, it's great. And then it's not going to be roses again. And then when it is, but bottom line, we have decided that we are together. So whatever the up and the down is, we have to do that, but we are together. Um, so, you know, if people can get inspiration from that, if I can get inspiration from that, <laughs> that's, that's amazing. And Kevin, you know, Owen's had kind of a rocky romantic uh, history, uh, you know, of all the couples that he's been involved in, you know, Christina, Emma, Amelia, now Teddy, uh, what would you say was your favorite to play? And I'm not talking about the actresses, I'm talking about Owen in that relationship, like what was your kind of favorite as, as you know this character and being in that relationship? It's interesting where Owen's character is right now because that episode was not meant to be our finale. <laughs> and now it's like Owen finds out that Teddy is cheating on him. I remember the season where Owen cheated on Christina. And this is kind of karmic payback, I think, for Owen's cheating. <laughs> and, um, and we had a lot of episodes, Sandra and I, where we would lock ourselves into therapy rooms and into our apartments. And, you know, and, and we would try and work through the, the and, you know, um, all that, that the stuff that cheating brings up. So I I remember that and it was just and just to get to work those scenes with Sandra in such an intimate way, it was such a brilliant actress, was such a gift for me, and I learned so much as an actor. So yeah, that was that was why I, re I remember as a high spot for me. And you know, Krista, obviously the Grays fan base is very vocal and very passionate, and they have thoughts about the couples. Um, question for you: We're in a safe space. In retrospect. <laughs> Are there any couples that you look back on and you're like, maybe we shouldn't have put them together? Oh my. <laughs> maybe we shouldn't have put them together. I mean, uh, look, I, this, I, this comes from a place of love, but like, you know, we're talking about the Izzy's and George's of the world, like that <laughs> situation. Like, are there, are there others where you're like, hey, you know, if I had Izzy. it to do again? Um. The Meredith George thing was really gross, but I think because it was, you had to do it <laughs> because it was hard to watch. You know, I, I fought against it so hard, and I often use that as an example of, of where, you know, Shonda would fight for stuff that I was like, this is appalling, and she was like, yes. Pre-pandemic, when you would walk down the street, what's the most pop, what's the most frequent thing you would hear from fans? Like, what do they want to talk to you about? I I absolutely love your show. And I need you to know, I need you to know that my daughter is uh, going to medical school right now. She's interested in, you know, whatever the field is. And it's because she saw your image on television. Oh. And can I take a picture? Can I take, can we do, can we call her? Can we call her right quick? <laughs> Before we wrap up, I just, you know, because this is the only show in our panel today that is still going on and we get to enjoy more episodes, I would uh, be remiss if I didn't ask Krista if you could give us a little tease of what uh, what we can see in season seven, 17. Sorry, if you could give us a yeah, tease what, of what we'll see in up, season Krista? 17. Yeah. Uh, what, what, what's coming up? I gave you that tease. I have not confirmed for anyone in the press yet that we are, in fact, doing COVID. So that's your tease. Thank you. That <laughs> is wonderful. It's a good one. It's a good one. I want nice. to say that, that our conversations have been constantly about how do we keep alive humor and romance while telling these very painful stories. So that's a real dance this year. And I, I, we, the writers are rising to the occasion. I'm really excited by the stories they're coming up with. Well, we're very excited uh, to be able to see more episodes whenever it happens. You know, we want you guys to get back to work safely when you can. And uh, thank you so much uh, for joining us. It's been a delight talking to you. And I hope you all uh, stay safe and sane in quarantine. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. Thank you so much to Krista Burnoff, Chandra Wilson, and Kevin McKidd. And of course, a huge thank you to Kristen Baldwin for moderating these incredible panels. And above all, thanks to all of you for joining us. Keep calm, carry on, and keep porn streaming. Good night.